Toll joint is not nearly as durable as your own joint is. This is actually more durable than your own joint. The flexibility piece, we're learning more and more that stretching is super important, right? People ignore stretching. Deep sleep should be about 13 to 23% of sleep. So that's about 60 to 100 minutes, 60 to 110 minutes. Depends on polar so it like locks. Some of the bad things that cast base one is Welcome to our Q&A highlights. Q&A sessions are recorded every month and our enhanced members get an exclusive opportunity to ask questions from one of cellular medicine's brightest minds, Dr. Elizabeth Yurth. Get a chance to ask your questions by becoming our enhanced member at bli.academy slash memberships. You also get access to our content library full of tips, articles, videos, lectures, previous live Q&A sessions, and more. Flexibility piece we're learning more and more that stretching is super important, right? People ignore stretching. Great studies from a guy named Dr. Postolopoulos, something like that, who that focused on stretching and they actually did blood markers like C-reactive protein and inflammatory markers. And they found that stretching the right way actually reduced inflammatory markers. And then a study that came out in 2018, it was in a, in a mouse model and they looked at breast cancer in mice and just by doing flexibility, I don't know how you work on flexibility in a mouse, but they did flexibility with these mice. They actually markedly reduced tumor growth, probably because of the reduction in inflammatory cytokines. They also saw high levels of upregulation by doing stretching. Micro stretching is, was by far more beneficial for both reducing inflammation and helping people to get more flexible and better joint range of motion. So what's micro stretching? The key is with micro stretching is you do an intensity that's about 30% of your maximum. So if I you know, took you to your maximum stretch, you're like, oh, there it hurts, right? Okay, that's my maximum stretch. I'm in pain right there. And usually stretching has been geared to holding at that site of pain, right? Or even trying to push a little beyond that site of pain. Micro stretching says back off 70% from that, all right? So- you're to 30 to 40% of your maximum perceived stretch. It's a very light stretch. It's a very light, gentle stretch. And you hold that for 60 seconds and you repeat that three times per muscle. So my hamstring, my quad, my pecs, whatever it might be. So what is the optimal sleep time? So really study came out pretty recently, huge study, like 500,000 people. They looked at people from the age of about 35 to 75 and they looked at brain scans thermograms of brains. And interestingly enough, the ideal sleep time was seven hours. Anything above that or below that, actually people had differences in brain volumes, different parts of the brain, if you were less than or more than that. So the optimal, so yeah, we'll say six to eight hours. The perfect sleep, if you want to be perfect, is seven hours in terms of having your brain the biggest in all parts. We know that REM sleep is really important. That's, your, that's the time when you're dreaming it's probably equally important to deep sleep. It should be about 20% of your sleep. So if you're sleeping eight hours, that's about one to two hours of REM sleep. Deep sleep should be about 13 to 23% of sleep. So that's about 60 to 100 minutes, 60 to 110 minutes. That's when your memories are consolidated. It's when your brain cleans everything out. So that's a really important for dementia prevention. That's your lymphatic system is turned on. Your, the toxins leave your brain during REM sleep. So that's a really, really, really important sleep for preventing dementia. Um, a group out of Duke University developed this very cool sort of water belt-based gel that replaces cartilage. It, it acts, acts like cartilage. So you can actually, it looks like a, a little piece of cartilage and you have a little, a little metal piece that you can put into the bone. You can just tack it onto the bone. Um, and it, it's made out of these cellulose fibers. They're infused with some polymers and it makes a really viscous goo with a bunch of, of sort of stringy chains that form a gel. And even though it's 60% water and it's like the size of a quarter, it's pretty small. It bears the weight of, you know, you can drop a hundred pound kettlebell on it from, from a height and do nothing to the cartilage. And when they stretched it, the cartilage, it actually pulled back together, squeezed back together. So these negative charged particles cause it to sort of rebound back together. So in one of the studies they did, they, they just kept pulling out like a hundred thousand times. It did nothing to this. In fact, it was, it was significantly more sturdy than your cartilage. So much, much, much better at withstanding forces than your own cartilages which you can't say about a total joint. 
toll joint is not nearly as durable as your own joint is. This is actually more durable than your own joint. So they also found, interestingly enough, that it was resistant to kind of um, being sort of torn or dislodged. So it's cool because certainly we do see people who are, they just are bone on bone and there's mechanical reasons for some of their pain then. So I do think this is really going to be a nice option and it looks like it may be to market maybe by the end of 2023, they're already starting human trials on it. So this is interesting. But remember, Dimitri, that it doesn't address why you developed the arthritis in the first place. It does not address that this is an inflammatory disease. So if I fix the little piece of medial cartilage on the medial side of your knee, what's going on with the lateral side and the other knee and your hip? This still is an inflammatory disease. So I, I think you have to do this hand in hand with treating the disease using things like penicillin polysulfate and other things that we can to treat the disease process, or this is a temporizing measure. You're just going to tailspin now. Uh, naps are actually a good thing, but they don't really count to that restorative sleep because you can't get into these deep REM sleep states when you're napping so much. And it appears that the optimal time for a nap is about 20 minutes. And beyond that, they probably make you a little groggy or they disturb nighttime sleep. 10, 20 minute naps, actually give you more energy. They help with nighttime sleep. They, they will actually um, give you an energy boost for about two and a half hours after that nap. So if you can get a 20 minute nap in, that's great. Longer than that, you may disturbing some of that nighttime sleep and creating a more difficult time. So it becomes this vicious cycle. You're tired during the day because you didn't sleep well at night. And so you nap and now you don't sleep well at night. So you probably need to set that alarm, get up at 20 minutes. <laughs> if you look at chronic fatigue syndrome, it basically is the same thing as long COVID. It's just that chronic fatigue was induced by Epstein-Barr virus. Long COVID is being induced by COVID infections, but they all create similar pathologies, vascular dysfunction, uh, fatigue, all those same things we're seeing. And, and again, we talked about these being mitochondrial damaging diseases. And so one of our focuses always is to start mitochondrial repair with peptides such as MOT-SC. If there's still any viral activity, lots of times there is, these viruses are sitting latent. Sometimes you really want to attack the virus as well. I love a supplement called Tolovit, and that's a great sort of antiviral agent to kind of get rid of any sort of lingering virus that could be active and in problems. But some of the cool new stuff we're finding about long COVID and probably chronic fatigue syndrome is that these people seem to have very high levels of something called caspase-1. Caspase-1 is upregulated, much like other cytokines that you've heard of with these diseases. It's this very, very pro-inflammatory cytokine that induces a bad interleukin response. If that stays upregulated, it just keeps cell death going. Bad thing. So basically, one of the places to go with that is to use things that are working multifactorially. So we love penicillin polysulfate because penicillin polysulfate blocks some of the bad things that caspase-1 is doing. So it blocks like interleukin-1 beta, which is stimulated by that caspase-1. So it's great because it's blocking that caspase one's effect. That's going to help you heal. That's going to help the blood vessels heal. It also is going to have an antiviral effect. So it actually blocks the virus from being able to attack cells. So it has some antiviral effects as well. And the last piece is some recent evidence is coming out that both of these diseases are linked to very high mTOR activity. Remember, we have mTOR, mammalian target of rapamycin, and AMPK. In general, we want to be in a high.